Hey everyone, um, so this is a recording of the second EEG lecture for the neuroimaging grad course uh, from last week. We had a computer malfunction, so I'm going ahead and a recording a video of this for anybody that wants to go over that material that you might have missed. So today we're going to talk about electroencephalogram event related potentials, clinical application to the loss of consciousness, and how can we evaluate biomarkers that we might draw out of EEG in this example, but also more generally, how might we evaluate any kind of biomarker that we draw uh, out of neuroimaging methods. So, oops. Okay, so first let's do a little review of last time. Um, so we talked about EEG origin in terms of where in the brain does the signal that we're recording with EEG actually come from. Um, and basically it's the synchronous activity in the parallel dendrites of the uh, pyramidal cells in the cortex is the most likely source for a lot of things that we measure with EEG. Um, we talked about the recording methods, um, so it's a super uh, small signal that we have to amplify and is subject to noise. We talked about how EEG can be used to look at different brain states. And one of the key examples of that is the transitions that the brain goes through as somebody falls asleep and how clearly that can be read out by looking at the EEG. Um, and we use the specific example then of the brain's alpha rhythm and how we can extract alpha power uh, from the raw EEG data and where in the brain the alpha rhythm might actually be coming from. And the alpha rhythm being kind of this marker of cortical idling that we see when people are not really engaged in a task but also not asleep, kind of in a relaxed, wakeful state. But what we didn't talk about last time really was cognition. So everything that we talked about was to do with brain state and you can think of the, of, of the brain state as kind of the context in which cognition can kind of be thought of as the content is actually happening. So how can we use EEG to get at the cognition or the content of what's being processed in the brain. Um, yeah, so processing of information content within a brain state. And can we use either state variables or cognitive variables usefully in clinical practice? So last time we really talked about EEG kind of broadly, but we didn't talk about whether or not it can be used uh, clinically uh, very usefully. And so those are gonna be a couple of things that we're gonna be trying to get into today. So our learning goals for today, uh, we want to learn what event-related potential analysis is, or ERP analysis. Um, we're going to see some examples of some classic ERPs. Um, we're going to ask how do we evaluate, oh, the, sorry, those in the wrong order. We're going to look at a, a particular use case of using ERPs to assess consciousness uh, in people who have brain injury. And then we're going to ask kind of more generally how do we evaluate whether a clinical application is really working. All right. So part one, how event-related potentials are measured. So event-related potentials, the goal is to measure the brain response to a particular stimulus. But the problem is that the brain has lots of ongoing dynamic activity. So uh, can you think of any aspect of the brain's ongoing dynamics that might interfere with measuring response to a single stimulus? I'll just pause for a second, kind of think to yourself uh, what aspects of ongoing brain dynamics might interfere with a measurement of a single stimulus. So, um, and, and an important thing to note here is that these ongoing dynamics are not noise. These are, these are really important aspects of the brain's overall state, but they might not be related to the particular stimulus that you're trying to measure the response to. And so we're gonna talk about the example of the alpha rhythm. This is just a review from last time. So this is one of those aspects of dynamic activity that can get in the way. So um, we know that the brain often has an ongoing alpha rhythm as well as various other oscillations. So we saw this example um, that was recorded in cat auditory cortex where when an electric shock is delivered to the auditory cortex at the beginning of each of these traces and then a auditory click is presented from a loudspeaker at each of these white arrowheads uh, you can see that the temporal offset between the electrical pulse and the auditory click has a really important influence over how big a response we get to that auditory click. Basically, we need a certain amount of spacing between the electrical stimulus and the auditory click 
in order for the brain to give a big response. And we saw how the alpha rhythm kind of uh, gives us the time constant of changes in that response to the auditory click. So we can think then that depending on what's going on in the brain, a particular stimulus might be processed in a very, very different way. We can see here in panel B that this auditory stimulus has almost no reaction uh, expressed in the brain whatsoever, but then by the time we get out to panel I, the reaction in the brain is huge. So depending on what that, that dynamic activity in the background is, we can have a really big difference in the way that the brain responds. So let's think about a simple task and how we might uh, try and get, get a response to a particular stimulus even despite these dynamic ongoing brain activities um, in this simple task. So in this ta task, a participant will see a series of X's and O's on a computer screen represented uh, here uh, in these, with these tiles. So the X's are about four times more common than the O's. And the participant presses a button after an O is presented. So this is an example of an oddball detection task. The participant is trying to detect that odd stimulus, the O stimulus. And here we have uh, an example of what data might look like from, uh, from an experiment like this. And so we're looking at data collected at electrode PZ here in the kind of center uh, top of the head. Um, and what we can see here, these boxes, are the periods of time around the presentation of these different stimuli. So we have a box circling, uh, a box uh, around this area where an X is presented, a box around when another X is presented, a box around when an O is presented, and so forth. Uh, where the Y axis here is the um, potential in microvolts, and the X axis is just the continuous uh, time of the experiment. And in the top, we can see a little schematic of uh, we're looking at the top of somebody's head and kind of looking over their shoulder as they view this computer screen that has an X on it right now. And if we just take a look at this, then it's not immediately obvious that there's necessarily a big difference um, between the responses to the X's or the O's. You could ask yourself, are the responses bigger to the X's or the O's um, as we look at this? And we can see that, okay, it looks like the first X is at about 20 microvolts, second X also maybe about 20 microvolts. The O is, um, you know, maybe it peaks up to 20 microvolts, but it's actually, you know, most of the time it's a bit lower, and that's true for most of, uh, for, for both of these O presentations. Uh, this X presentation looks a lot like these two O presentations, and then this last X presentation is again getting back up towards 20 microvolts. So it looks like overall maybe the response to the X's is a little bigger than the response to the O's. Um, but let's see how that pans out as we look at it in more detail. So what we can do um, is we can actually, rather than just kind of eyeballing this uh, in the way that I just did, we can average together the responses to all of the X trials and then average together responses to all the O trials um, to create uh, what we're going to call then an event-related potential. So here in panel E, we're looking at those traces to uh, the, the six different stimuli, the, two, the four X's and the two O's. Um, and then in panel F, we're looking at the averaging of, in this case, 80 uh, presentations of the X and 20 presentations of the O. And so what you can see is that we get these really clean looking waveforms. Um, and in both of these, we have um, kind of a positive peak at about 100 milliseconds, then a negative peak just after that, then a positive peak at about 200 milliseconds, then another negative peak right after that. And then we get this big kind of slower peak um, at around 400 milliseconds. And what we can see is that that last big slow peak that here is being labeled P3, and we'll get into these names in a little bit, um, but here is being labeled P3, that's a lot bigger. Um, for the O's than for the X's. So actually when we average things together and we look at these overall ERPs or event related potentials, um, we can see that the response to those odd stimuli, those oddball stimuli or the O's um, is bigger. Um, so how do we talk about ERPs? Um, so I've already kind of thrown around these words waveform, uh, ERP, peaks, um, but, but what are, what's kind of the terminology here? Um, so the overall shape is sometimes called the ERP waveform. So that refers to the overall curve um, of the whole, the whole thing uh, that you're looking at here. Then each peak of an ERP is going to be labeled as P or N and then some number. So the P or N simply refers to whether the peak is a positive going peak or a negative going peak. 
and then the number refers to the timing. So a P1 happens at about 100 milliseconds, and then a P3 happens at about 300 milliseconds. The timing is not always super precise on the way these things are named. Um, so they are also kind of categorized by what sort of cognitive phenomena they're sensitive to, and we're going to see some examples of that in just a little bit. Um, but in general, you can tell a lot quite quickly by just looking at the names. If something is called the N2 or the N200, you know that it's going to be negative going at about 200 milliseconds. And each of these peaks is called a component. So we have multiple components that make up an overall ERP waveform. The P300 is the same as the P3, it's just a different choice of terminology. So that's that same thing I just mentioned, kind of an N2 or an N200. You could have a P3 or a P300, a P1 or a P100. Uh, sometimes you'll see people write out the whole uh, three digits, sometimes just one digit. It doesn't really mean any difference, um, it's just a difference in terminology choice. So where do these ERP components come from and why do we care so much about thinking about each of these peaks in the waveform as being somehow different or special? So the idea is that each component is likely to be coming from an independent neural source. So if we imagine um, in this cartoon we have three different neural sources um, labeled C1, C2, and C3 for component 1, component 2, and component 3. And then we have three electrodes, E1, E2, and E3. The idea is that there's some set of weights such that all three components are going to be picked up by all three electrodes, but different electrodes are going to be more or less sensitive to different components depending upon the spatial organization of the neural source and the spatial location of the uh, electrode that's receiving the signal from that source. Um, and that just has to do with the geometry of the way the cortex is folded, the size of the cortical generator, and its location. So we can see in this hypothetical scenario that we have something that we might call component 1, component 2, and component 3. Um, and it's no accident that this example, these look a whole lot like something that we could call a P100, an N100, and a P300. Um, three very common ERP components that we'll be talking a little bit more about uh, in just a bit. Um, and then we look at electrode 1, 2, and 3, which through different weights are representing some kind of combination of all three components. And so you can kind of ask yourself, um, you know, which of these electrodes is in a position where it's most sensitive to, say, component 1. And so that looks like it's probably electrode 3. Or we could ask which uh, electrode is in a position that it's most sensitive to component 3, for example. Uh, and so that's probably electrode 1 or electrode 2. They both look like they're picking up quite a bit of uh, component 3. Um, so each electrode picks up all the components, but with different strengths. Um, and this fact that we can see these components, these different peaks, kind of varying seemingly independently at different locations on the scalp is one of the primary pieces of evidence that these really are being generated by different sources within the brain. So um, we've been kind of dancing around talking about the P300 a little bit and this is a representation of where on the head we might expect to measure a P300. So this is the type of uh, ERP component response that we expect in that oddball detection task uh, that we've been mentioning. And you can see, looking down at the top of someone's head, there's the nose uh, indicated at the top. Um, this is going to be an ERP component that has a, um, a, a peak right in the kind of middle top of the head around electrode PZ. Um, and in particular, this, this is a topographical plot, um, is what we would call this. And this is displaying the average voltage in microvolts um, between 351 and 401 milliseconds after a stimulus comes on screen. Um, and yeah, we can see it's maximal at electrode PZ. So um, there are various different ERPs that are going to pop up during stimulus processing. And what these ERPs kind of show us is that there's a series of events that take place as a stimulus is processed, and it happens really, really fast. So um, each of these topographical plots is showing you the topography of a different ERP component occurring at a different point in time during the processing of, uh, of a stimulus. Um, and these are, from, these are drawn from different papers and, and, uh, and with participants doing different tasks. So the idea is not that this is all going to happen in exactly this sequence in exactly this way, 
but the big take-home point from this is that we do have these different topographies with different components. So even though they might be part of the same waveform in some cases, that doesn't mean that they are uh, being generated by the same neural source. Um, and they're going to be sensitive to different aspects of cognition. So we have uh, what's called the P1, or the, uh, the positive uh, component at 100 milliseconds. Um, and that's generally going to be found on the back of the head. Um, and then we have the N1 quite quickly after that, uh, happening around 170 milliseconds or so. Um, sometimes this is, as we'll talk about in just a little bit, sometimes this is called the N170 rather than just the N1. Um, and it has a topography that spreads a little bit more um, along the sides of the head. Then we have the mismatch negativity happening at about 150 milliseconds um, and having uh, this, this negative um, peak that's really prominent on uh, central frontal areas. Uh, and then we have the P300, which can be broken down further into the P3A and the P3B, and we'll talk about the distinction between those in a little bit. So for right now, yeah, don't worry too much about remembering exactly these uh, different components. We're about to go ahead and review uh, and go into talking about these components in a lot more detail. But the main thing here is just we do have these different topographies which tell us there's likely to be different neural generators for these different components. So various ERPs during stimulus processing, it's really hard to say where in the brain each ERP component comes from. So unlike with fMRI, where you can really pinpoint what area of the brain something is happening, here we can't really do that. But we can say that the different topographies do imply a different neural source. So um, what's cool about this then is that we have this window on changes in cognitive activity um, that's happening in different places in the brain on a very fast time scale. You can see here we have a series of five different events that are all happening in less than 400 milliseconds. So how can we separate these components? Um, and the primary way this is usually done is through contrast. So contrasting two different behavioral conditions against each other and in order to try and see is it possible to find two different behavioral conditions where uh, only one component changes. So um, as we've been talking about, there's going to be multiple neural sources generating signals with overlapping time courses. So this is seen in the figure here where in panel A, uh, we might have an ERP waveform that looks like this with a peak 1, a peak 2, and a peak 3. Um, but then in panels B and C, you can see there's at least two different sets of underlying components that could give rise to the same set of peaks that we observe in panel A. And um, notice that P1 has an earlier peak than either C1 or C1 prime. So that's an interesting thing that the, the peak timing um, observed in the waveform can actually be a little bit distorted relative to the peak timing of hypothetical components uh, underlying it. And then notice that C3 and C3 prime uh, begin much earlier than can be seen in the overall waveform. So we can see that both of the C3 components are beginning here at this first uh, tick mark here, um, but we don't really see them coming in on the overall waveform until that uh, second tick mark. So um, again, the timing of peaks can really uh, be quite different from the timing of the underlying components, and that just has to do with the way that they're summing together at the level of the scalp. So let's think about how we might separate these components. So um, the three plots here are representing hypothetical data from three different behavioral conditions. And always in black, we're looking at a baseline condition with the different dotted lines showing you, um, you can imagine different behavioral conditions that participants might be in. And you can see that um, different components can be, uh, can be influenced independently. So the solid lines indicate baseline, the dashed lines indicate conditions, um, and each condition affects a different underlying component. So for example, in panel D, we have an example case where a decrease in the amplitude of, C, uh, of C2 prime uh, in condition X. Um, or in uh, panel E, an increase in the amplitude of C1 in condition Y. So we've got conditions X, Y, and Z here in these three panels. Um, or in panel F, we can see what it might look like if there was an increase in the amplitude of C3 um, in some hypothetical third condition. 
and we can see that each of these things has a different influence, where a change in the C1 component is only affecting the early part of the waveform, and a change in the C3 component is only affecting the later part of the waveform, uh, with a change in the C2 component affecting some area in the middle of the waveform. So how can we then visualize these underlying components? Um, so now just kind of revealing to you the whole, the whole figure that we've been working through here. Um, so you've already seen the first two columns, but if we now take different scores um, between different conditions, so for example, if we take in panel D the dotted line minus the solid line, we get a result in panel G here, um, which shows us the, uh, the revealed component C2, uh, or C2 prime, sorry, um, completely on its own. And so by looking at contrast between different behavioral conditions, we can isolate um, these, these independent components. Okay, so, so let's go over some take-home points for this part. So ERPs help to overcome the problem of dynamic background activity to allow us to isolate stimulus-evoked activity. And they're calculated really simply by averaging together multiple repetitions that all share a key characteristic. So for example, all having the same stimulus or all requiring the same cognitive process. The waveform of an ERP consists of multiple bumps and we call these bumps components. Uh, and we generally believe that these components are being generated by different neural generators. So different components have distinct spatiotemporal patterns um, in how they are measured across the scalp and at different time points. And different components likely have different brain sources. Um, and components can be isolated by calculating different scores between multiple ERPs uh, drawn from different behavioral conditions or when participants are viewing different stimuli. Okay, so part two, uh, we're gonna go through kind of the zoo of different ERP components. And we're by no means gonna cover all of them, but we're gonna talk about a few. So we've already seen uh, this series of figures. There's a bunch of different ERP components and the ERP show us that there's a series of events taking place as a stimulus is processed. And here we're gonna focus in on the P1 or P100, the N1, or sometimes also called the N170 because it happens really later than 100 milliseconds. It usually, usually shows up around 170 milliseconds. We're gonna talk about the mismatch negativity or the MMN and, the, and then the P300 uh, and we're going to break it down into uh, different subtypes of the P300, the P3A, and the P3B. So let's start with the P1. We're just going to be moving kind of forward through time. So the P1, um, it has this uh, topography in lateral occipital cortices, uh, or sorry, lateral occipital areas of the scalp, indicating that it's likely coming from occipital cortices, um, and it seems to be sensitive to visual information processing. Um, it's likely produced in extra striate visual cortex, that's the leading idea, um, and it's modulated by arousal state. Uh, we can see that um, down in this uh, bottom plot. We've got two different um, uh, ERP waveforms showing the P100 um, from participants in a high arousal state versus in a medium arousal state, and you can see that the P100 is larger in the high arousal state. Of course, we can also see that just the entire waveform has been elevated. So this may be um, a bit of a general phenomenon rather than anything specific to the P1. Um, the P1 is sensitive to general visual processing, um, as we just mentioned. Um, and, the, and one question that we want to keep in our mind now is, is the N1 truly a different component from the P1? Because um, if we look at the scalp topographies here, you can see that the P1 and the N1, they have really similar topographies, but just with inverted signs. So the P1 is positive and the N1 is negative, but the topographies are really quite the same. So is it possible that this is just a single component from a single neural generator that has a biphasic electrical response, or are these truly different components? Um, and that's gonna be a question to kind of hold in mind um, as, as we move forward here. Um, and I'm gonna try and convince you that yes, they are in fact truly different components with different neural generators. So um, before we move on to that question though, let's uh, take a closer look at, uh, still at the P1. So this was a cool experiment in which um, stimuli were shown to participants um, and the location of the stimuli was spatially modulated. Um, 
So we had stimuli that were shown in the upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right, um, and then central, so covering a large area of the visual field, uh, or control trials that uh, just had no, uh, no stimulus. And what we can see when we look at the topographical plots um, is that when the stimuli were in the uh, left side of the visual field, the P1 showed up on the right side of the head. And when stimuli were presented on the right side of the visual field, the P1 showed up on the left side of the head. Uh, and then when the P1, uh, or sorry, when the stimuli were shown in the center of the visual field, we can see that the P1 then showed up bilaterally. So this fits super well with the idea of contralateral representation in the visual cortex. So um, again, that kind of shows us that the P1 is likely involved in just low level stimulus processing. Um, and it has similar time course, but different topography when seen uh, with auditory stimuli. So there is an auditory P1 as well, but uh, shows up with different topography. And we're not going to talk about that uh, here today. Um, the P1 also, interestingly, can be found even when participants are being put under general anesthesia. Um, and so here we're taking a look at results drawn uh, both from participants being put under sevoflurane anesthesia and also under propofol anesthesia. So to collect these data, participants would have had their eyelids propped open while they're put under anesthesia, and then visual stimuli would have been, would have been presented to their eyes while EEG data were recorded. Um, and what you can see is that although the amplitude of the P100 uh, is reducing with the increasing anesthesia and the timing of the P100, especially with the sevoflurane, seems to be drifting out later in time, um, we still have the basic shape of the P100 occurring regardless of whether or not someone is under anesthesia or awake, um, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. So this is really a component that does not require attention, does not even seem to require that the participant be conscious. So let's move forward now to the N1 slash N170. So the um, super classic finding is that the N170 is sensitive to face stimuli. So in this experiment, subjects were presented with different images. Um, oh, and sorry, it occurs at more like 170 milliseconds, so the N1 or N170. Um, and what was found when participants were presented with these different images was that the N1's amplitude uh, was largest for human faces. So if we take a look here uh, at data from electrode T5 and electrode T6, so on the temporal, um, temporal side of the head, uh, on the left side and also on the right side, um, we can see in the solid line the ERPs associated with human faces. So we can see a P100 followed by the N100 or the N170 uh, and then a more sustained response after that. But the key thing is this negative going peak uh, that's happening uh, right here at just before 200 milliseconds. And we can see the scale bar down in the bottom right. And what you can see is that that negative going peak is much more negative uh, for the human faces than for any of the other categories of stimuli. So this seems to be really um, uh, strong evidence that the N170 uh, is quite sensitive to the content of the stimulus that's being processed. And that's in strong contrast to the P100, which you can see also represented here, this positive going peak that's happening a bit earlier, that is not at all changing as a function of what stimulus is being processed. And yeah, notice the lack of difference in the P1. So here we are looking at the topography, um, and the nose is at the top. Uh, we're looking at the overall voltage represented in the color scale at different time points. So from 88 milliseconds, 120 milliseconds, 170 milliseconds, and then 230 milliseconds. And what we can see is that um, the uh, N170 is more temporally um, represented than the P1. So the P1. Here, these red splotches on the back of the head is very much on the back of the head, whereas by contrast, the N170 um, is bilateral and uh, more, uh, more temporal, kind of spreads out along the side of the head a bit more. Um, so it's got distinct timing, distinct topography. It has stimulus selectivity that the P1 doesn't have um, and different voltage uh, from the P1. So in all of these ways, it seems like the N170 is truly a different 
thing uh, from the P100, even if it is the case that both of them are involved in relatively early processing of visual stimuli, uh, they seem to be making independent contributions coming from independent neural sources. Um, and then we're just going to take a quick look at the N170 in passive viewing. So in the previous set of data that we were looking at, participants had been instructed to pay attention to the stimuli and make categorization uh, responses to every stimulus. But now in this experiment, um, there are only three stimuli, a particular face, a coffee mug, and a car, um, a face, car, car and, uh, and a coffee mug. And there's hundreds of presenta presentations of each and there's no task, the participants are just watching. Um, each presentation can be either right side up or upside down. And so the question is, will the response uh, that we measure with the ERP change as a function of right side up or upside down? Um, and so what we can see is that for the face stimuli over on the left, the size of the N170 is really quite a bit larger when the face is inverted versus when it's upright. But by contrast, for the coffee mug and the car, we don't see any such difference. There's no change in that negative going peak um, as a function of whether the stimulus is right side up or upside down. So what this shows us then is that the N170 is stimulus selective even when there's no task, even when participants are not really paying attention. So let's move on forward now to the mismatch negativity or the MMN. And so um, this is usually studied with auditory tones, unlike the um, P100 and N170. Um, so a typical, or a typical experiment, participants might be presented with 1000 hertz tones. That would be the standard tone on the majority of trials. And then occasionally there would be a 1080 hertz, slightly higher pitched tone. That would be the deviant tone on a minority of trials. So there would be two conditions then uh, that we're going to be interested in in the experiment that we're going to review. Uh, in one condition, participants are ignoring the tones, so there's no task, it's completely passive, uh, and they're watching a movie and paying attention to the movie while these tones are kind of just being overlaid uh, over the top of the movie's audio. And in the other condition, participants are again watching the movie, but this time they're being asked to attend to the tones being presented and give a response whenever they detect one of those deviant higher pitch tones. So um, first, let's take a look at the data from the ignore condition. So in the ignore condition, um, there's an N1 component that's the same for both conditions. Um, and so we can see, uh, and I'm sorry, these are plotted with negative going up. That is something that people do with ERP sometimes. They plot negative up. You can see that on this scale bar with the negative sign at the top and the positive sign at the bottom. So we can see that in both the standard and the deviant trials, there's a negative going um, uh, bump that happens quite early at about 100 milliseconds. Um, and so note that that N1 auditory is pretty similar to the P1 visual response. Um, and then the mismatch negativity differentiates the standard versus the deviant. So we can see that the uh, in the case of the deviant tone, um, the response is quite a bit more negative. So we see that in the sense that the ERP to the deviant um, is staying higher on the plot, which remember again, higher means negative in this plot. Whereas to the standard tone, we can see that we get an N100, which quickly drops off um, and, and, and falls backward, falls back. Um, over on the left, uh, we've got the hypothetical components that underlie this. So the mismatch negativity, which is simply the subtraction um, or the difference between the two. Uh, and then the dotted line is showing you the averaging of the two to tell you kind of what's common between these two conditions. Um, so we can see that that mismatch negativity gets really nicely separated out by looking at the difference between these ERPs. So now what about the attend condition? So in the attend condition, there's a lot more going on. We can see that the standard, the response to the standard tone really doesn't change at all. It looks about the same as it did in the ignore condition. But in the, um, uh, in the deviant condition, um, now we have this P300A, or uh, the, so that positive 300 millisecond response. Um, and then we have an N2, uh, and we have a frontal slow wave, uh, which is a, a sustained negativity. And when we look at this in terms of components then, 
uh, we can see there's a lot more stuff happening here, but critically, that mismatch negativity is still there and still looks pretty much the same. So in both the ignore condition and the attend condition, the mismatch negativity is there. Um, it's just that in the attend condition, we have quite a bit more stuff that seems to be going on. So, um, so really critically, the take home from this is that the mismatch negativity, which detects kind of novelty or surprise, uh, is not dependent on attention. And here we're looking at the uh, some summary information about the mismatch negativity. So it happens at about 200 milliseconds post stimulus, usually studied with auditory stimuli. Does not require that the participant be paying attention. Uh, it's more negative for stimuli that deviate from normal. And we can see over here that it has a topography kind of in the middle frontal areas of the scalp. So continuing on, we're going to take a look at the P300A. So um, this is going to be elicited when subjects are asked to pay attention and detect a particular kind of stimulus. So you'll get a P300 response if participants are asked to detect target stimuli that occur on their own. So this is what we might call a single stimulus experiment. Um, and you'll also get, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to advance that, you'll also get a P300 response in an oddball paradigm like what we've been talking about where there might be a lot of standard uh, stimuli represented here by the S's um, and then there will be occasional target stimuli that the participant has to uh, actively detect and so over here on the right then we'd be see we'd be looking at the uh, ERP in uh, light gray to the standard stimuli and then in dark black to uh, the target stimuli and you can see that big difference is the P300. Um, critically, the P300 is entirely absent when people don't pay conscious attention. Um, it is large in amplitude, it's positive, happens at about 300 milliseconds, hence the name P300, um, and it's widely distributed over central areas of the scalp. So now what about the P300B? So um, again, participants might be asked to detect a target stimulus, but in this case we have what we might call a three stimulus experiment where there are standard stimuli represented by the S's here um, that, are, uh, that are easy to discriminate um, and then, or relatively easy to discriminate. Um, and then there's going to be distractor stimuli which are really compelling. Um, so a compelling distractor. So for example, um, if you're asked to detect O's and the letter C is presented, that will be a more compelling distractor than the letter X because the letter C shares a lot of the same um, kind of visual features with uh, the letter O where the letter X does not. Um, and so in this case, a, uh, the target would get a P3B and compelling distractors might get a P3A response. So the idea is that that compelling distractor is causing um, attention or attentional orienting whereas the target is causing uh, attentional orienting but also working memory updating and more elaborative encoding. So when the load is high, working memory updating or long-term memory encoding is going to get indexed by the P300B, um, whereas when load is low, uh, we'll only get a P300A. So uh, one way to kind of sum it up is to say that the P300B represents elaborative processing of some kind. So some take home points from this part then. So the P100 is positive, happens at about 100 milliseconds. It's visually evoked. It is not stimulus selective. It is not conscious. And it has a back of the head topography. The N1 is negative, happens at 170 milliseconds. Hence, we sometimes call it the N170 rather than just the N1. It's visually evoked. It is stimulus selective. Uh, it also does not require attention um, uh, to, to, uh, to show up, um, and it has more of a side of the head topography. The mismatch negativity, or MMN, is negative. It happens at 200 milliseconds. Uh, it's auditory evoked, stimulus selective, uh, not attention modulated, and has a mid-frontal topography. And then the P3A is positive, happens at about 300 milliseconds. It's multimodal. Um, it is stimulus selective um, within the context of the experiment. Um, it is attention dependent and it has a central topography. 
And then the P3B is positive, happens uh, maybe just a little later than the P3A, 300 to 400 milliseconds. It is also multimodal. Um, it is stimulus and context selective. It's attention dependent, and it also has a central topography. So hopefully you can see from reviewing this kind of handful of ERP component examples um, that really these components are sensitive to quite different aspects of the behavior and cognition that's going on uh, during the time that these ERPs are being recorded. And in addition to that, they have different timing, different scalp topography. All of this comes together to make us uh, have a pretty good level of confidence that different components are being generated by different sources within the brain. So let's talk about a use case. Is it possible to use ERPs to assess consciousness in people who have had a brain injury? So uh, can we use ERPs to assess brain damage severity? So let's imagine a situation. If a patient has sustained brain injury, how do we know if they're likely to regain conscious function? Particularly if they are in pain, maybe under sedation, maybe they have had injury to motor pathways, um, and so they can't really respond in, uh, in a normal way. They're not going to be able to participate in an oddball detection task, for example, to see if their ability to detect particular stimuli is still intact. Um, how can we get at this? So, um, and then the other problem that we've got is that consciousness is highly subjective. So we need to come up with some way to operationalize a non-objective or, or, uh, or sorry, a non-subjective uh, measurement of consciousness. So cognitive tests are hard to implement in the ICU. Um, so we know that the ERP responses that continue out to about 300 milliseconds are likely to be conscious. We saw that there was a real dividing line between the P1N1 mismatch negativity um, that all occur before 300 milliseconds and then at 300 milliseconds we suddenly have the P3A and the P3B um, which are really very conscious processes. You know, P3A is related to um, novelty and attentional orienting and the P3B to uh, working memory updating and kind of elaborative processing. So both very conscious activities. Um, so is there some way then that we could see whether or not the P300-like activity um, in people's brains is intact without having to have them do a cognitive test, since that is going to be really hard for, uh, for patients to do potentially. So how can we measure this in the clinic? So one way that, um, that it can be done um, is with transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, uh, to use that as a stimulus rather than using some kind of a visual or an auditory stimulus. Instead, um, what researchers can do is literally ping the brain with a pulse of TMS um, so that's magnetic energy um, being pinged at the brain, and see how does the brain respond to that TMS stimulus. And the idea here would be that we can kind of bypass a lot of the initial processing of the stimulus by pinging directly into higher level cortices rather than having the information need to pass through um, primary sensory cortices. So. No overt response is required. We're just going to look purely at the EEG following the TMS pulse. And here um, we can see ERPs uh, from TMS pulses. They do look a little different from any of the ERPs that we've been looking at so far. Um, but here we're looking at a bunch of different um, EEG responses um, across 450 trials arrayed along the uh, the y-axis of this heat plot. And at the top, we have um, the participant is completely awake. And then over the course of a 15-minute period, the participant is falling asleep. And each of these snippets of data, we only have um, about 600 milliseconds of data in each of these snippets, um, has all been aligned to center around the time point of TMS pulses being delivered into the participant's brain. And so what we can see, if we create ERPs by averaging together several of these trials, um, as is shown in panel B, um, that uh, initially the response is uh, quite temporally variable. We get uh, several different peaks, several different components happening during wake. And as the participant falls asleep, they develop a large, really fast, very stereotyped response with a much smaller number of different components. 
So the, um, the late complexity that we see during wakefulness, where there's all these different components happening right out to 300 milliseconds, that's really lost as people fall asleep. So um, if we look at this in a little bit more detail now, um, during wakefulness, the ERPs exhibit high spatiotemporal variability. So in panel A, what they've done here is they've laid the ERPs from several different EEG recording electrodes. They've just put all of the electrodes ERPs right on top of each other. So we can see that early after the TMS pulse, some of these um, waveforms are going up, some are going down, uh, some are kind of staying in the middle. Um, and over time, they, there are these different epochs um, across uh, about a 300 millisecond total amount of time where sometimes there's a lot of variability across different channels um, and that's been highlighted in red uh, and then all the channels kind of come back together and then they split back apart again. So we have these, uh, this kind of evolving set of brain states that's happening across a pretty short period of time following this TMS pulse. Um, and then here in panel B we can see the, topo the topographical maps representing these ERPs. So um, you can kind of almost visualize this as, as like frames in a movie with the activity kind of bouncing around inside the head. And then in panel C, they've projected the activity to hypothetical sources on the cortical uh, surface. And again, you can kind of think of this as clips uh, or frames in a movie clip um, with the activity kind of bouncing around inside the head. Um, but then when we compare a similar kind of analysis uh, done during non-REM sleep, uh, what we can see is that very stereotyped ERP. So there's a quick large response followed by a slightly more sustained large response. Um, and then maybe there's a, a third uh, component happening here. Um, but in all cases, you can see that the activity is not bouncing around uh, the head very much. It's really just sitting at one spot and all of it is over by about 120 milliseconds uh, after the TMS pulse as opposed to activity continuing uh, out to 300 milliseconds during the wakefulness state. So during NREM sleep, ERPs exhibit high amplitude but low spatiotemporal variability as we just talked about. So now what do these TMS uh, ERPs look like in patients? So here they had a set of five patients um, that were in vegetative states, uh, uh, abbreviated VS here. And what we can see is that patients in persistent vegetative states exhibit TMS ERPs that look a whole lot like the ERPs that we just saw to NREM sleep. Um, again, we have this initial quick response, a long sustained response. Um, and that seems to be happening for all of the patients. Uh, patient four, it's quite a bit lower amplitude. Um, but if you look over on the right side, the waveform uh, shape still looks quite similar. Um, so the consistency across subjects is really quite striking. Um, you know, usually in ERP experiments, there's a lot of averaging that's going on across, uh, across participants. Um, but here, it seems to be the case that even on an individual level, for the most part, uh, we can see um, these kind of, this kind of characteristic uh, ERP response to the TMS pulse in these vegetative patients. So um, what about uh, TMS pulses in kind of other groups of patients? So they looked at minimally conscious uh, patients. So these, uh, and you can see these patients have quite a bit more complexity in their ERP responses, um, more like waking. And then they also looked in patients with locked in syndrome or LIS, and again, uh, quite a bit more um, temporal complexity uh, in the responses. So again, it looks a lot more like a waking state. So this does seem like a good proof of concept, at least, that this uh, TMS ERP approach seems to be a way that we can get at looking, uh, looking for um, some, sort of, some sort of a canonical sign of someone being conscious versus non-conscious. So how can we take this, though, and make it into something that's really quantifiable? Um, we don't want it to be a situation where um, someone has to be kind of squinting at a bunch of ERPs and trying to read out whether or not someone's conscious. We want to get it to a point where uh, there's really an objective measurement. So um, to do that, uh, they, they're trying to convert this, uh, this TMS ERP into a binary um, source uh, activations over time. That's going to be the first step of their analysis. So 
um, you can see they uh, start with the overall ERP up in panel A. Um, at various different time points, they have the topographical plots of the ERPs. Um, then in uh, panels C and D, they're showing us source localizations um, of, the, uh, of the topography that we're seeing in the, in the top set of plots. Um, so this is showing us where in the brain um, it is believed that the activity being represented in the ERP is coming from. Um, and then in panel E, they're going to turn it into just a series of binary values. So every area of the brain is going to be um, demarcated as either on or off. Um, and then they can turn this into a set of, um, into a set of sources uh, by time um, kind of vectors. So each one of these spatial patterns, um, how much is that spatial pattern turned on or not across time? So again, we're going to have time on the x-axis and these different spatial sources on the y-axis. Uh, and anywhere that you see black, they're saying, okay, that's a spot where there's an actual representation of the, uh, or sorry, there's an activation of that spatial pattern. Um, then they're going to put this through a lempel ziv compression, uh, which it's gonna be beyond the scope of this lecture to get into the math of that. Um, but essentially they're uh, trying to draw out a measurement of how much information or complexity um, is there in this uh, overall matrix of sources by time. Um, then they're going to normalize it um, so that it has a range between 0 and 1 in kind of the same way that we normalize a lot of different statistics. For example, the correlation coefficient, which, range, which always ranges uh, from negative 1 to positive 1. Um, so they do a normalization step. Uh, and in this particular example case, they get a pertur perturbational com uh, complexity index of 0.55. Um, yeah, um, so their information content uh, is extracted and compressed, and we get this final uh, perturbational complexity index, or PCI. So the question now is how well does this PCI index function for detecting consciousness, or being an index of consciousness? So. Um, the first thing that they wanted to check was does it change as a function of the, um, uh, the stimulation intensity? Um, because if you can turn the, if the consciousness index is just an index of how strong the, um, the, the TMS pulse is, uh, that's really no good. We want it to be something that's really reflecting the, um, the neural activity, not really reflecting the strength of the initial TMS pulse. So um, we know that it is sensitive to wakefulness. We can see that in this example that uh, during wake, we get a PCI of 0.51 versus NREM sleep, we get a PCI of 0.23. So that's good, that's pretty separate, pretty different. Um, but it's not sensitive to stimulus intensity, which is really good. So here we have uh, 90 volts per meter being delivered in the TMS pulse. Uh, and in panel C, we have 160 volts uh, per meter, you can see that the ERPs um, represented in the left side of the figure are a lot bigger um, for panel C than they are for panel B. But even though the amplitude is bigger, the complexity is not changing. And as a result, that PCI value stays essentially unchanged at 0.21, which is good. So then they wanted to test it out um, looking uh, a little bit more, uh, in a little bit more detail at subjects under various different conditions. Um, so, and also they wanted to know is the PMI value, uh, or sorry, PCI uh, value, um, is it sensitive to the location that, uh, that stimulation is delivered? So um, we can see that it is sensitive to wakefulness versus sleep and various anesthetic agents. So um, the PCI values that we get when people are awake uh, represented um, all, along, uh, all along the top here um, are very consistently higher than the PCI values that we get when people are either asleep in NREM sleep uh, under midazolam, xenon, or propofol anesthesia. Um, so it doesn't seem to matter how consciousness is lost. Uh, in all cases, the uh, PCI value drops to around 0.2, whereas when people are awake, the PCI value is hovering around 0.5 to 0.6. Um, and then we can see that it doesn't really matter what area of the brain is being targeted with TMS. Broca's areas uh, 8, 6, 4, 7, and 19 will all yield uh, roughly similar 
um, uh, PCI values. Uh, so that's good. That means that there's not going to be a need for really specific targeting uh, with TMS. It can be targeted to any old spot on the cortex and um, the intensity of it also doesn't seem to really matter. Um, no matter what, the thing that does matter is whether or not the person receiving the TMS, the TMS pulse is conscious. So that's really good, looking really nice for a potential consciousness indicator. Um, so yeah, not sensitive to stimulus intensity or location. So those are good things. So now, what about when we look at this uh, in some patient populations? So um, here they had patients that were vegetative, uh, in a vegetative state, uh, in a minimally conscious state, emerging from a minimally conscious state, or in locked-in syndrome. Um, and what we can see is that 100% of the vegetative and unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, that's that UWS, uh, patients exhibited PCI values that were below the maximum of the NREM sleep slash anesthesia distribution. So what they've done here is they've essentially said, okay, this is the distribution that we measured in healthy subjects for non-REM sleep uh, or anesthesia. And the maximum of that distribution is 0.31. So they're gonna then use that 0.31 as kind of a threshold or cutoff or criterion. Um, and say that any time that someone exhibits a PCI below 0.31, that's similar to those non-conscious uh, sleeping or anesthetized uh, participants, that probably indicates that that person is not conscious. And 0% of the patient groups exhibited such low PCI values. So we can see that um, of the other patient groups. So what we can see then is that these minimally conscious uh, or emerging from minimally conscious or locked in patients, all of them have PCI values above 0.31. Um, so this is great. This is perfect sensitivity and perfect specificity. Um, and these are, uh, are going to be terms that we're going to talk about a little bit more, where sensitivity is how sensitive are we to be able to detect all of the cases we're trying to detect. And in this case, we're trying to detect a lack of consciousness, a vegetative state. So we are 100% sensitive. All of those uh, participants fall below the threshold. Uh, and then how specific are we? What is our specificity? Um, to what degree do we accidentally um, bin people who are not part of our target group as being part of our target group? And in this case, 0% of these other patient groups are being binned as uh, vegetative. So that means we have perfect specificity. Um, and this is really a rare case. Almost never will you see a situation where you have perfect sensitivity and perfect specificity. Uh, and of course, that perfection would be unlikely to hold up if uh, we saw this with a larger set of participants. Um, but it is really promising to see that uh, at least with this small group of participants, they're able to demonstrate um, really, really great sensitivity and specificity. So, and then uh, an anecdote that I, uh, I really liked from this book uh, by Stanislas Dehaene, Consciousness in the Brain. Um, and he's talking about kind of a bit of the story behind the development of uh, this consciousness detection paradigm. Um, and he notes, uh, in the intensive care unit, our EEG test occasionally provides vital help. For instance, following a terrible car crash, a young man had been in a coma for three weeks, remained utterly unresponsive, and suffered from so many complications that the medical team was debating whether to discontinue treatment. Yet his brain still exhibited a strong EEG perturbation response. We persuaded the doctors that a positive evolution was still possible. His medical condition improved so dramatically that he was able to resume a virtually normal life. So this kind of lets you kind of peek into uh, how impactful this kind of research could eventually be if these types of methods are implemented um, clinically on a large scale. Um, probably, uh, un and unfortunately, there are many, many cases um, throughout the world where somebody comes in um, they seem to be in a non-responsive state um, and medical care is withdrawn and that person ends up dying. Um, and then on the flip side, there are going to be cases where um, their participants or sorry, patients um, are receiving care um, and, and uh, family members are waiting in hope, um, but that patient never recovers. Um, and so being able to test in a definitive way which patients 
uh, we should be investing care in because they have the potential to recover and which patients don't. Um, being able to assess that uh, is really pretty cool um, and, and helpful. So some take home points from this part, we can leverage knowledge about which ERP components are dependent on consciousness to detect consciousness in patients. Super cool. This technique is aided by transcranial magnetic stimulation, which standardizes the stimulus uh, perception and removes the need for the patient to pay attention. Um, sensitivity and specificity are both perfect in preliminary studies using this method, so that's really promising. So um, in this last part of the lecture, I wanted to talk just a little bit then about how can we evaluate whether a clinical application really works. So in this case of detecting consciousness using TMS ERPs, um, it looks really good and probably the researchers responsible for that are moving forward right now with, uh, with larger scale clinical trials. Um, but how statistically can we evaluate whether or not these things are worth applying and, and using in the clinic? So um, let's think about evaluating diagnostic tests. So an ideal, an ideal test detects 100% of people who have a target condition. So sensitivity is 100%. And an ideal test will never say that someone has a target condition if in fact they do not. So that's perfect specificity. So uh, an example of why this is so important to balance these things is if you had a test that said that all humans have COVID-19, then that's perfect sensitivity, but it's entirely useless because its specificity is horrible. Or by contrast, if you had a test that said no one has COVID-19, then that would again be a test with perfection in some ways. It'd be perfect specificity. It would never have a false alarm, but it's useless because it has no sensitivity. So this brings us to the idea of signal detection theory, which is fundamentally about balancing these competing goals of having sensitivity and specificity. And the idea here is that there's going to be some signal distribution. Um, and that this distribution you might think of as kind of has disorder or someone like has COVID-19 or has consciousness or has depression or has autism, uh, whatever the thing is that we're trying to detect. Um, that would be the signal distribution. And then there's going to be a no signal distribution. So then this could be does not have COVID-19, does not have consciousness, um, does not have autism, does not have depression, whatever the thing is that's kind of the background or the control or, uh, or the, the thing that we're trying to separate from, if you will. Um, so this might be is healthy, for example. Um, and the challenge is that they're arrayed along this strength axis, this latent strength axis. So in the example that we were looking at just now with consciousness detection, this latent strength axis uh, was operationalized as the um, perturbational complexity index, that PCI value. Uh, and then you can imagine that there's a distribution of PCI values for uh, conscious and a distribution of PCI values for non-conscious. Um, but that latent strength axis, um, it's always going to be something that we have to operationalize. So um, you could think about it as maybe a uh, number of antibodies, uh, like antibody load of COVID-19 antibodies. And that could be your latent strength axis where we anticipate that the people who have never had COVID-19, their antibodies are going to be really low. Um, whereas people who have had COVID-19, their antibodies are going to be really high. And that might be the uh, the way that we operationalize the latent strength axis for a COVID test, for example. Um, and uh, in the case of thinking about neuroimaging, this could be an EEG or an fMRI or a brain volume measurement. Really anything that you might want to measure, um, we can put that on the latent strength axis and then ask, is there a separation now between some signal and some noise distribution? Um, and then the, um, the other big challenge with this is drawing that response criterion. So we have to draw a vertical line somewhere, even though these distributions are overlapping, we have to draw a vertical line somewhere. And then we just have to say, anything that's to the right of the line, we're going to assign that the label signal. Anything to the left of the line, we're gonna assign that the label no signal. Even though we know that we're going to have some area of the distribution, um, where the noise distribution will rise above the criterion. And so we're going to have 
a failure of specificity. We're going to have some false alarms. Uh, and we're going to have an area of the signal distribution that falls below the response criterion. Um, and so we're going to have a failure of sensitivity. We're going to have some misses. Um, and that's just kind of what's, what's going to end up happening in most situations because of this overlap in these two distributions. So how do we want to evaluate the performance of a particular criterion? Um, so hopefully you can see from this that the choice of the latent strength variable, how we're going to operationalize that, and then the choice of a response criterion um, are going to be two really critical things in uh, trying to evaluate whether or not a particular diagnostic test is doing a good job. So how can we evaluate the performance of a particular criterion? Um, so here I'm just drawing an example from uh, this old paper from Grinner et al. Um, and they're looking at detection of coronary artery disease using an exercise tolerance test. And so we've got this confusion matrix where um, there's uh, some people are shown uh, have a positive result on the exercise tolerance test and they also have the disease present. So that would be a positive detection. That's good sensitivity happening right there. Um, and then on the exercise tolerance test, some people will have a negative result. And indeed, they do not have coronary artery disease. So that would be um, some good specificity, accurately saying that these people do not have the disease. Um, so how do we actually calculate sensitivity? Uh, it's going to be the true positive results. So uh, up here in box A divided by the total patients with the disease. So that's going to be 1,023 down here at the bottom, the, the sum of this disease present column. So in this example then, our sensitivity would be 80%, just plugging those values in. And then specificity is going to be the true negative results, so that's panel D over here, um, divided by the total patients without the disease, so the sum of that second column. And so in this case, uh, we can just plug in those values and it's 74%. So that's, that's pretty good, 80%, 74%. Um, so in general, these statistics are helpful in evaluating diagnostic performance. Um, but critically, they are dependent on the choice of criterion uh, and on the choice of strength axis. So uh, in this case, we've chosen our strength axis to be the exercise tolerance test, whatever that is. Um, and then somewhere there's a criterion that's being used to split the output of the exercise tolerance test into positive and negative. Um, so those are the decisions that are being made under the hood that then yield these sensitivity and specificity values. So um, let me now walk us through how we might construct what's called a receiver operating characteristic. So this is a way to kind of evaluate the performance of the strength axis uh, independent of criterion choice. Because um, I think one thing that you might be able to appreciate here is that the criterion choice um, is kind of secondary to the choice of our strength axis. Um, you know, is the exercise tolerance test generally a good test? It could be a good test, but we might be pairing it with a bad criterion. Um, so we want to know um, how good is the test independent of our criterion choice. And then once we know whether or not the test is good, we can try and establish the best practice for what criterion we want to use. So um, let's think about this example um, using uh, some data from, from this autism study um, that, uh, that we read for last week. Um, so the, here we're looking at the spatial difference between the right medial and lateral areas of the scalp in power in the alpha frequency band. But that's not super important. Um, what is important is that we're going to choose some strength axis. In this case, we're choosing this measure of alpha power. Um, and then we're going to look at how the autistic and neurotypical participants fall along that strength axis and ask, does this strength axis give us a good axis of, uh, of diagnostic separation between the autistic and the neurotypical participants? So. Um, we can see, looking at these box plots, that the biggest difference between groups on this variable is happening in this third age group, so we're going to zoom in on them. Um, and so here I've just put that same box plot up at the top, and then I've replotted the same data as histograms. Um, so we're going to focus on the data from that oldest age group. Um, the AD and the ASD, so the tan and the blue 
groups have been collapsed together, just for simplicity here. Um, and then it's replotted as histograms. So immediately we can see that using this power asymmetry in the alpha band um, as our strength axis, there's definitely a difference between the autistic and the control participants. Um, the control participants seem to effectively straddle zero, whereas the autistic participants seem to be skewed to the positive um, on this axis. So there, there is indeed some separation, um, but the question is, is that separation, and, and indeed in the paper we found that uh, it was pretty strongly statistically significant. Um, but the question is, is it going to be di diagnostically relevant, even though it is statistically significant? Um, so let's construct a receiver operating characteristic. So to do this, I'm going to start um, by putting a criterion along that EEG variable axis. And I'm going to draw that criterion here with this vertical line. Um, so everyone above the criterion we're going to categorize as AD and everyone below the criterion we're going to categorize as CON. Um, and I'm putting quotes here to indicate that this is our categorization but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's correct. So the ground truth here is which of these distributions the participant comes from uh, and then we're giving them these labels depending upon where they fall relative to our criterion. So let's start with a criterion at a value of 0.4, which we can see with the vertical line here. Um, this is a really boring criterion because no one from either group is above the criterion. So no one gets, gets binned as, um, uh, as being autistic using this criterion. This is a case then of perfect specificity, but absolutely zero sensitivity, um, kind of a trivial case. So let's try and see if we can find one that's a bit more interesting. So what if we move the criterion to a value of 0.3? Um, and we can see that with the movement of this vertical black line. So now 2.8% of the autistic group is above 0.3, so non-zero amount. But only 1.2% of the control group is above 0.3. So we're starting to see something happen. So in other words, sensitivity is 2.8% and specificity is 98.8%. So we're still almost at the trivial case. Specificity is very high, sensitivity is very low. Um, and we could rephrase this and call this uh, the hit rate is 2.8%. Out of all of the autistic participants, we managed to have hits or accurate diagnoses for 2.8%. And the false alarm rate is 1.2%. So out of the whole control group, um, we accidentally called 1.2% of them autistic even though they were not. So that's a 1.2 false alarm rate. So now let's move that criterion to somewhere uh, quite a bit more interesting. Let's move it all the way to a criterion of 0 0.05. So now it's really in the meat of both of these distributions. So now we get 48.2% of the autistic distribution, so that's our sensitivity or our hit rate. And we get 27.3% of the control distribution, so that's our false alarm rate. Um, so sensitivity 48.2, specificity 72.7. Um, hit rate 48.2, just keeping in mind hit rate equals sensitivity. Um, and then the false alarm rate of 27.3, where false alarm rate just equals specificity, or sorry, one minus specificity. So now, how can we generate a curve that kind of shows us all the different criteria choices at once? Um, so what we can do is we can take these hit rates and false alarm rates that we generate with different criteria and we can plot them as uh, points on a two-dimensional scatter plot. So we can see hit rates on the y-axis and false alarm rates on the x-axis. Um, and here I'm just going to kind of move through a few different criterion choices and each time as the criterion moves to the left um, we can see we get more of both distributions uh, incorporated uh, into our hit and false alarm rates. So I'm going to just kind of build this up one point at a time. And we can see as we go, we keep getting new points added to what we're calling our receiver operating characteristic, or ROC. Until eventually, when we sweep the criterion all the way across the distributions, we're always going to span from 0, 0, the trivial case where we have perfect specificity but horrible sensitivity all the way to 1-1. One, one. The other trivial case where we have perfect sensitivity but horrible specificity. So this plot is called the receiver operating characteristic or ROC. 
um, it, it represents the whole range of possible criteria. So each criterion is associated with a different sensitivity and specificity. Um, and the area under the curve characterizes the general character uh, categorization ability of our choice of strength axis. So this is a way that we can now evaluate our choice of strength axis. In this case, we're using that measure of alpha power. We can evaluate that axis choice independently of criterion choice, um, which is really a very powerful thing. Um, and keeping in mind here that the diagonal is chance. So although um, autism and neurotypical groups are significantly different from each other, um, ROC analysis reveals that classification can never be that far from the chance line. So what you can see is it doesn't matter where we put our criterion, we're never going to get these green dots very far away from the chance diagonal. In an ideal world, what do, you, what do you think we want the ROC to look like? So if you just think about it for a second. So yeah, we, we want that ROC to have a really high hit rate and a really low false alarm rate. So ideally, it would jump from the 0, 0 point up to the 0, 1, and then um, and, and show us kind of that perfect sensitivity and perfect specificity up in the top left corner uh, of this plot. So here's an example returning to uh, that early paper from Grinner et al, um, where they're comparing using uh, two different types of scan to try and uh, diagnose brain tumors. So they're using computerized tomography or CT scans versus radionuclide, uh, radionuclide scanning um, or RN scans. And so what you can see here is that, and I've just drawn the chance line here as a blue line. Um, keeping in mind that their axes are a little off because they don't go all the way to 100 on their false positive rate. Um, so that's why this doesn't look like a diagonal, but it, it is. Um, and so what you can see here is that the CT scan diagnostic uh, is definitely better than the RN scan. Um, and that's represented by being closer up to that top left uh, part, of the, part of the plot. Um, so. One thing to notice here, though, is that it is possible for an RN scan to have higher sensitivity than a CT scan. So if we were to take the rightmost RN scan point and the leftmost CT scan point, you can see that we'd actually get better sensitivity with the RN scan than the CT scan. So what that example shows you is how important it is to use ROC analysis where you can look at the entirety of the ROC curve um, and in that way compare uh, the, the actual underlying strength axis rather than getting clouded by accidentally comparing criterion choices uh, when what you really want to be comparing is that underlying choice of strength axis. You know, is the RN scan axis or the CT scan axis the better axis to be uh, doing your, your testing on? Um, so ROC analysis, is, it allows you to eliminate the need to choose a criterion. Um, which is really great because with this whole problem of signal detection, we have two big choices to make. We have to choose our strength axis and we have to choose our criterion. So if we can eliminate one of those choices and evaluate the strength axis on its own, that's going to be super powerful. Um, so what about base rates? Um, and this is going to be a big issue in a lot of diagnostic situations. So many psychiatric and neurological conditions are rare. Um, but most scientific studies collect artificially balanced groups where we have about 50% of the participants or controls and 50% have the condition. So what does this mean when moving to the clinic? So here, what I've done is I've simulated a situation where 18% of the total group of participants have autism disease, um, or uh, autism disorder, sorry. Um, and that's uh, the reason for 18% is because uh, estimates show that eight, about 18% of children with an older sibling with AD will also end up being diagnosed with AD. Um, and so that's, uh, that's kind of a representation of this potential situation in the clinic. You know, maybe you have uh, some parents come in, they say, hey, uh, our oldest is already diagnosed with autism. We're, young, we're worried about, uh, about our youngest child. Um, can you help us understand whether or not our youngest has autism? And so in that situation, you know, just going in, that that younger child has about an 18% chance of also having autism before you do any kind of examination of any kind. 
Um, so that's what this uh, situation represents here. So um, if we set our criterion then at uh, 0 0.05, um, it's going to yield the same false alarm um, and hit rates uh, as with matched sample sizes. Because keep in mind that the false alarm rates and the hit rates, which go into plotting the receiver operating characteristic, the ROC, um, those are proportions. So because those are proportions, they will be entirely insensitive to base rate. Um, so in this case, 48.2% of, uh, of the AD group is above the criterion. 27.3 of the control group is above the criterion, just like we saw before. But the ratio of false positive to true, to true positives is going to be very different. So um, in these two situations, so on the left we have a situation with balanced group sizes, and on the right we have a situation uh, with unbalanced group sizes. So on the left we get 44 false positives. So there's 44 controls uh, that are being uh, erroneously diagnosed with autism based on this criterion. Um, and we have 69 true positives. So that gives us what we might call a false positive index of 0.64. So basically what that's telling you is 44 divided by 69 is 0.64. And a way to think about this conceptually is that for every true diagnosis that you make, you're going to end up making an accidental 0.64 incorrect diagnosis. Um, but then by contrast, in this simulation, um, uh, if we have 3,985 false positives and 1,282 uh, true positives, um, that's going to yield a false positive index of 3.1. So the only thing that's changed in these situations is how the, is, is the base rate. Um, what is the kind of raw percentage of the population that has autism in the population under study? And what you can see is that as that uh, base rate goes down, this false positive index is going to really skyrocket. Um, and that has a lot of implications. How, uh, how, how valuable is it to accurately diagnose someone versus how costly is it to accidentally diagnose someone with autism who actually does not have it? Um, and so that's, that's a, a big question to kind of wrestle with as you think about whether or not it's a good idea to use um, a, a diagnostic test that has kind of the types of characteristics that we're looking at here. So take home points for this part. Uh, so receiver operating characteristic analysis can reveal diagnostic test performance independent of criterion choice, which is its great power. A significant group difference does not guarantee a good diagnostic test performance. So in the uh, autism example that we looked at here and kind of more broadly in the autism example in the paper that we read for last week, um, there are a lot of significant differences between the aut autistic and neurotypical uh, groups in that study, um, but none of those differences were useful in thinking about a diagnostic test, even though they might have been significant group differences. Um, and some measures of test performance are sensitive to base rate, but not all. So whereas um, ROC analysis, which is so great for looking at the performance of a strength axis independent of criterion, um, it has a lot of advantages. Uh, it's not sensitive to base rate, but something like the false positive index that we looked at at the end of that part is sensitive to base rate. Uh, and that can be very important when thinking about trying to detect rare, uh, rare conditions. Um, functionally, in the clinic, base rates matter a lot, yet statistics that are sensitive to base rates are rarely reported. Um, so this is something to kind of keep in mind as you read papers. Um, try and pay attention to things like effect size and think to yourself, you know, with an effect size of X, do I expect that um, in a case with low base rates, uh, this test would really work as well as the authors claim that it would. So uh, just overall review for the lecture then, uh, we talked about event-related potentials. Um, they're the average of many similar trials with the goal to distill the common response to a stimulus. Um, the bumps in an ERP waveform are called components, and they are thought to reflect independent neural generators. Using transcranial magnetic stimulation to elicit an ERP can yield a consciousness detector that may be clinically useful. So that was a cool kind of example case of how ERPs can be used. Uh, and then at the end, we talked about signal detection, signal detection theory. 
uh, which included uh, receiver operating characteristic analysis and thinking about these important ideas of the strength axis that you might want to use to evaluate um, for a diagnosis, the criterion that you're going to choose, and uh, how base rates can interact with all of that. Okay, um, thanks. That's it for this lecture, um, and hopefully you enjoyed. Um, oh, and that's just some figures from the paper. All right, thanks.